This is hell. Violence is inescapable. It's unavoidable. It's inevitable. And it's simply part of human nature. It's part of who we are as a species. If you believe that, then you are on the path, the road to self-annihilation of all humanity. Here to guide us through the horrors that is violence, political philosopher, critical theorist, writer, and professor Brad Evans is author of Atrocity Exhibition, Life in the Age of Total Violence. Welcome to This is Hell, Brad. Hi, great. Thanks for having us on. I've been really looking forward to having you on the show because uh, Henry Giroux is a regular contributor to This Is Hell, and I've seen your writing with his as well as your writing with Natasha Leonard, who is a semi-regular uh, co- contributor to This Is Hell. So I've been really looking forward to this interview. You can find out more about Brad on Twitter at Hist of Violence, short for History of Violence, H-I-S-T of Violence, and you can find out more about Brad at his website, Brad hyphen evans.co.uk. You start by quoting J.G. Ballard's 1970 collection of interrelated stories that shares the title of your book, The Atrocity Exhibition. Ballard writes, the the media landscape of the present day is a map in search of a territory, a huge volume of sensational and often toxic imagery inundates our minds, much of it fictional in content. How do we make sense of the ceaseless flow of advertising and publicity, news and entertainment, where presidential campaigns and moon voyages are presented in terms indistinguishable from the launch of a new candy bar or deodorant? What actually happens on the level of our unconscious minds when within minutes on the same TV screen, a prime minister is assassinated, an actress makes love, an injured child is carried from a car crash? Does our violent media landscape make us more sensitive or does it desensitize us to violence? I think it's a very good question. I I don't necessarily believe that populations are necessarily desensitized to violence. And, and actually, I I agree with um, when the philosopher Jack Rancière points out. He says, on the one hand, you know, modern societies we have this kind of proliferation of certain representations of violence. And much of that can be banalizing and, and often, of course, presented to us as forms of entertainment. And yet, on the other hand, um, other forms of violence we know are completely mediated. Um, and the, the way in which they're mediated in terms of the, 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 the raw realities of suffering um, goes through a, a form of overt politicization. So I think we are exposed to certain forms of violence and are actually kind of censored around other forms of violence. Um, and I think that in itself raises very interesting questions for us. But I think it's certainly the case that our societies have witnessed the proliferation in terms of representations of particular forms of violence, which are often presented in very banal and, I guess, decontextualized ways. And I think that's part of the problem. So what do you mean by violence? Because news reports often equate vandalism with violence. We have had guests Mm -hmm. on who are concerned about what they call economic violence, including unfairness and inequality. So what do you mean by violence? What kind of violence concerns you? Well, as you know, as I wrote, uh, first of all, I guess in the book with um, Henry called Disposable Features, and the more recent books I said with the Atrocity Exhibition, I guess part of the argument which I try to make now is that violence is the defining organizational principle for our societies. Um, but one of the tasks which I try to engage with as a critical theorist is to, I guess, ask the question of what actually is violence, and this is the point that you make. And in the sense, of course, we know that violence is actually very poorly understood if it's simply reduced to bodily harm. And we only have to look at the psychological reports of victims of domestic crime to tell us that, you know, there is a psychic life to violence, which precedes and also exceeds the actual physical act of, of punishment. Um, but also, I think, political violence, and we know there's the there's politics underway in terms of the very naming of something as political violence or not political violence. And it's very easy to look at for instance, men on battlefields or terrorist attacks and label them political violence. Whereas other forms of structural violence like homelessness or even drug addiction or, again, for instance, domestic abuse, which if you look at the broader kind of cultural apparatus which normalizes it, is it we can make a very compelling case to say that that's a political form of violence. So I think as a society, we need to have um, much more rigorous conversation around what actually is violence and then what actually classifies as a political form of violence. Beyond that, I think the the forms of violence that concern me, I think, well, first of all, I would say that violence in all its its forms needs to be condemned. 
Um, and, and we have to be kind of careful that we don't impose a hierarchy that some forms of violence are worse or better than others. Um, from the perspective of the victim, it doesn't really matter. Um, but I, I do think the forms of violence which really, I guess, concern me in the contemporary moment are precisely the forms of violence which can appear to us without any serious critical attention, or if they do appear to us, we'll dwell on it for a day and then kind of move on. And I think that's the kind of thing which I try to deal with with the, the book, The Atrocity Exhibition. It's, it's precisely to take, you know, I, I, I thought J.G. Ballard was remarkably prophetic in, in that the, the, the wonderful quote that you read out. Um, and Ballard senses that we are entering into an age of the, dominated by the spectacle of violence. And the spectacle of violence comes at us with such ferocious speed and intensities now that we simply don't have time to dwell on it before the next image arrives to us. And I think those are the kinds of violences which really concern me is how, you know, how do we make sense of this constant repetition of new forms of violence in our imaginary without even having the time to dwell upon them? So. When you were just saying that uh, violence is our defining organizing tool, does violence then keep us from chaos or does violence bring about chaos? Mm -hmm. Well, I think what I mean by that is, you know, if we look back just in terms of, I guess, the, you know, the, the basics of political theory, we, there was always this understanding that, especially from the advent of the modern period, that security is foundational to our understanding of politics. And in that sense, the, the modern political project was striving to make people feel secure I think what's happened certainly since the wars on terror is pretty much a tacit assumption that all life is now fundamentally insecure by design. And, you know, and you have this constantly, even like when Barack Obama was speaking at Ground Zero on the 10th anniversary of 9-11, when he says, look, you know, another terrorist attack is inevitable. Right? And this shift to the normalization of insecurity and vulnerability we see kind of played out in narratives around resilience and so forth. That plays into a very particular understanding of, where, of first of all, that violence is now inevitable. And this point that you, you actually made in your you know, um, wonderful introduction, actually, about this almost assumption now that violence is inevitable. There's nothing we can do about it. We were born of violence. Violence is natural. It's simply what humans do. And actually, the future is just violently fated. And I think that is the worst kind of nihilism. And we, but, but it's kind of part of the the accepted script now and also through that then we you know it's not just violence associated with some death death drive violence becomes a condition of possibility it allows things to happen you know through the chaos new forms of political rule can be authored and we look at the the current landscape in the united states of america just to see how violence is you know everything from race relations to the attitudes toward migrants violence is the, the default setting for any form of political discussion, and it plays into a certain politics of fear and the narratives which invariably support that, because nobody, you know, nobody wants to be the victim of a violent encounter, but it's kind of the spectre which is all, always there now for politicians to draw upon continuously. What does the term atrocity exhibition reveal about authoritarianism that, like Henry Giroux calls it, the architecture of violence? He writes that in your introduction to your book. Uh, so what mm -hmm. does the term atrocity exhibition reveal about authoritarianism that the word authoritarianism does not? Why atrocity exhibition and not simply authoritarianism? Mm -hmm. Well, one of the things about you know, the um, old authoritarian regimes, first of all, was um, much of the violence in which they conduct, whilst they would engage in symbolic forms of violence, they would often operate in secrecy. And actually, you could say that the hallmark of 20th century totalitarianism and authoritarianism was precisely the, the use of secrecy and the use of secrecy as, as a weapon in order to create certain forms of, you know, of um, and normalize certain forms of oppression. I think the difference between 21st century regimes, which are no less oppressive, is the ways in which actually, rather than operating in secrecy, it's almost like an assault upon visibility. So everything is made open and apparent, or largely everything is made open and apparent. And for me, then, the atrocity exhibition is how do you create fearful, anxious, insecure subjects? Well, you constantly create conditions which normalizes the age of catastrophe and violence. So there's a constant exposure to endangerment, a constant exposure to threatening 
events and so forth. And I do think, you know, one of the, I think what I try to point this out in the introduction to the book, the the actual relationship between the exhibition has now changed. If you think of, for instance, just walking into an art gallery, you're kind of, you're the viewer and you're walking around looking at the exhibits. But in the age of new media technology, of course, it's actually humans who are largely, largely static. And it's the, the exhibitions which are constantly coming to you. So you are the one who's kind of rendered inert and re- rendered incapable of fleeing from it. Um, and I think one of the, you know, one of the defining characteristics of the modern period is how we're all forced witness to these exhibitions. And, and they, they allow you no opportunity to flee. And I think that, that we can argue, of course, historically, one of the most effective political rights anybody had was to flee from conflict, to become a migrant. And, and, and that's completely denied us in this new oppressive regime of the media spectacle. How does that technology, you think, change the way in which we understand or even accept or tolerate violence? Well, I think the, the one, the, one of the things about, you know, um, I think if Nietzsche was right, that war can be seen as, you know, one of the principal drivers of history, technology is often the driver of war. And again, war broadly understood. I think what technology really does, and new media technologies now, is fundamentally also the relationship between perpetrator, victim, and witness in the context of violence. So, you know, we know, for instance, the perpetration of violence is now often recorded on new digital devices, and the broadcasting of those images alone can reach audiences which are exponentially far greater than, you know, what would have happened 50 years ago. And and also then the act of witnessing that process and, and that kind of so the producer of violence, the consumer of violence, the witnessing of violence, all that's really transformed with the age of new media technologies in a way in which we still have no real sense of the ethical kind of considerations, you know. And it, it seems that only now we're really starting to come to terms of what the ethical possibilities of old conventional journalism might look like. And now we have this age of the new media technology where we always know that technology runs a pace of our ethics. It's almost like the tech, we produce the technologies, then work out what the ethics might look like. And in that sense, I think new media technologies, whilst, of course, they are, yeah, they, they, I, I'm, not, I'm not completely a Luddite, and I'm not saying, you know, we should be anti-technology. Um, and we know, for instance, the advent of the Internet has been remarkably liberating in terms of, for instance, the capacity to reach much broader audiences with a positive message. But I do think that is an, you know, there's an ethical dilemma with these technologies, especially when it comes to violence, where the capacity to be exposed to violence in an unmediated way is also very, you know, um, something we're still yet to grapple with in terms of the ethical considerations. You know, so how much do you think that's driven by, you know, here in the United States, we are U.S. news, uh, network news, media, and I think this is true with cable news as well. They will not show, uh, as they did during the Vietnam War, a dead American soldier in the field of battle. Mm-hmm. They won't show that mm-hmm. anymore. How much mm-hmm. is this violence then on the new alternative media of the Internet, the web, how much is that driven by the fact that violence has been taken away, has been censored from other news media or other more traditional mm-hmm. news media? Mm-hmm. Well, I think, you know, that, that works on a number of levels, and, and I agree, you know, and this is the point I was trying to make at the beginning, you know, it's, it's not that we are exposed to all forms of violence. We're exposed to some forms of violence, and there is, especially in the mainstream media, there's, of course, a great deal of mediation of the types of violence you are exposed to, and that we know is subject to very clear politicization. Now, one of the, you know, one of the issues we have to kind of say then is, okay, why is there a certain impetus then from certain perpetrators of violence to try to kind of break through that um, censorship of violence? And it's almost like that, you know, they have to try to find loopholes within the system to get the message across. Now, we know that one, you know, from history, one of the, you know, the surest ways of grabbing attention to a political cause is by engaging in violence. It's grabs the attention of people. It certainly grabs the attention of politicians. And I think what one of the dangers of that, of course, is by censoring violence in the way that we do um, and, and allowing for other discourses of violence, those who believe their violence to be just will try to find alternative ways of broadcasting it, such that you have, for instance, the most horrific videos 
coming out posted by groups such as ISIS, who tried to play through the loopholes in this. But also, I think what you know what, what these particular kinds of organisations have also understood is, if we if we think about historical representations of violence, often actually when you see the violence, the humour is often removed from the scene of the crime. So I'm thinking in particular years of like representations such as Hiroshima or Nagasaki, but even contemporary warfare, as you say, we know war to take place and you never see the soldier coming home in the body bag. So we often remove the victim from the scene of the crime. What perpetrators of contemporary forms of violence who are trying to shock us into their message understand is we seem to have an intolerance for very intimate depictions of violence. And they will play upon that narrative precisely because we almost kind of censor those narratives in a way that, oh, for them, they have to play to that game. And I think that in itself demands a much serious conversation from us. A report released by Apollon Research Magazine from the University of Oslo this week quoted Havard Moklev Nygaard, research director at the Peace Research Institute Oslo, which has used statistics to conduct research about armed conflicts. Nygaard says the wars after the Korean War, 1950 to 1953, have killed a quarter as many people as the wars before the Korean War. Apollon states Nygaard calls such a change here regarding the number of people killed in battle viewed over time a breaking point. They say like Nygaard continuing, the change after this breaking point is an indication that the world has become a more peaceful place. They also quote Nils Lidhjort, who is professor of statistics at the Department of Mathematics in the University of Oslo, saying, although the Korean War is the best guess, the breaking point could also have been in 1945 or at the end of the Vietnam War. However, although the exact uh, time is uncertain, we still see a clear difference between the number of people killed before and after the breaking point. Does that Hmm. necessarily mean we are in an unprecedented era of peace and nonviolence? No. Um, And I think uh, for a whole number of reasons. First of all, um, a lot lot of this statistical measure, it kind of reminds me actually of the work Steven Pinker does as well, that, you know, arguing that we live in this, that we never lived in more peaceful times. Now, first of all, part of the question around you is how do we conceptualize violence? And I I think a lot of these studies have very crude, reductive understandings of what actually is political violence. And for instance, I guess you could statistically prove prove that, you know, violence against people of color in the United States of America has statistically gone down. But of course, we know incarceration rates have increased exponentially. So how we conceptualize violence in itself is certainly, you know, part of the issue there. And of course, that this is pointing to men on battlefields and and that in itself is a problem. But I think there's a much more, you know, much more troubling thing with with those kind of statistical measures, because what it seems to say is if we have a battle with 100,000 casualties and another battle with 200,000 casualties, it's kind of okay to have the battle with 100,000 casualties. And to me, that's the most remiss form of ethics. There's still 100,000 casualties. And I don't think that we should judge violence and for better or for worse in terms of such crude quantifications, because it simply gets us into particularly the kind of narratives which underwrite, you know, theories such as just war. Right? It's, it's OK to kill 100,000 people if in the future more people live in peace. So I think that that type of quantification is ethically compromised in the extreme. You're right that we need to consider violence and its history as a whole, and it is here that representing violence as inescapable is unacceptable. It would mean we have already surrendered to the most totalizing human claims that we have accepted our species annihilation. Why does accepting violence lead to inescapable doom for humankind? Because we had a guest on a while back, and I can't remember who it was, but he was saying that uh, you know, global warming started when we invented fire. So I was just curious, Mm -hmm. uh, what does accepting violence, uh, how does that uh, lead to our inescapable doom? Well, I think if we understand violence to be not only an assault on a person's dignity and selfhood, so that that to me is one of the the most clear, obvious, immediate effects of violence. If you engage in violence upon another, you're immediately, you know, um, taking away their sense of dignity and selfhood. That, to me, is always and already a collective problem. So every form of violence is a cut into the flesh of the earth. Now, to me, violence ultimately is a surrendering of the idea that people can live 
with political affirmation and dignity. To normalize violence is to normalize the everyday forms of nihilism, which deny a human the right to be human. Um, collectively, if we normalize violence, then we are ultimately giving ourselves over to the triumph of nihilism. It's kind of interesting also that you point, and I think there's a history to this when you talk about, for instance, fire. I, when I think about, you know, if we look about the history of the human condition, you walk into any single natural history museum, and the first thing you encounter will be an exhibit of two men in a cave rubbing sticks together, and they have fire, and therefore everything is survival, and we have to, you know, c construct these narratives of violence, which naturalize violence from that moment onward. I think we need to rethink our entire history as human species, whilst, of course, there's a survivalist narrative which plays into this naturalization of violence. I'm kind of taken by Gaston Bachelard's idea around fire, and he says, well, you know, could fire not have a much more poetic, loving connotation at its inception, not simply that it's all about humans in a dank cave having to fight saber-toothed tigers and surviving. I think we need to rethink the very history of the human condition, not just the future, and to break out of this narrative that humans are just naturally violent. So why would you think that humans aren't naturally violent? Because I've heard that so many times that that's why we are at war is because we are naturally driven to violence. Why do you feel that that is not the case? Is it more? I don't want to put any words in your mouth. Why do you think that's not mm -hmm. the case? Well, I think that this idea that, that humans are naturally violent becomes a necessary political construct to normalize its occurrence. Now, for me, you know, if everybody was naturally violent, then I think the human species would have been long since extinct. We brought ourselves to that point on a number of occasions. But I don't think, I think if we were so naturally violent and we didn't have this innate compassion for empathy, love, human consideration, to me, that not all humans are display violence. I think violence is a construct. I think violence is a very real phenomenon, but I don't think... And I also think, you know, if, if you just watch children play, and children can kind of, you know, have arguments and disagreements, but for the most part, children are full of wonderment. They're, they learn to become violent, actually, by mimicking adults. So I don't think there's something inherently violent the way children are born. You know, young children... To, to my mind, are more kind of filled with wonder and love, and they learn to slowly become violent because we teach them that, you know, violence is sometimes the way to get their way. Or So, so I don't think there's anything in, in, innate to the human condition from the moment of our inception that makes us naturally violent. You write that turned into producers of content and forced witnesses to human suffering on a daily basis. Our sleeping minds are often violently interrupted as if we are continuously playing out the awakening scene from Hitchcock's Vertigo. We awake from yeah. nightmares night after night only to realize that nightmare is the present condition. What is the impact on the individual psyche and our more collective public health from being in our present normalized nightmarish condition. Does this lead to, you know, we've had conversations with George Monbiot, with Johan Hari, with a lot of different people on our show about the epidemic of loneliness that is uh, taking place in the UK and here in the United States and depression. Does that uh, normalization, that normalization of that nightmarish condition, is that what is, is violence, what is leading us to being depressed? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, you know, part of the issue around, I think, the normalization, for instance, of insecurities and vulnerabilities today is, again, and I've written about this in my critique of the doctrine of resilience, is very much about, OK, you know, learn to take care of yourself in the face of such violence, in the face of such conditions. Now, how do we kind of, you know, make sense of how do we deal with this normalization of violence? That violence operates precisely at the psychic level of power. And and it's it's a form of violence which, if we accept, for instance, the catastrophic fate of the world, that there's nothing we can do about it, that condition at the, the level of psychosis is very atomizing, very individualizing. It makes us believe that as a collective, there's nothing we can do about global warming or there's nothing we can do about another terrorist attack. We just have to accept the inevitability of it and learn to bounce back. Such atomization, for me, is part of the condition of making us feel insecure, vulnerable, and which are very, you know, innate characteristics of feeling alone in the world, that we, that nobody is there collectively to support us, that the social state won't protect us, so nobody's going to protect us in that regard. And, you know, as one, um, I was reading an article in the New York Times, I think it was published a year ago, which was saying, you know, loneliness is the greatest killer. 
and we have to come also to terms with that. You know, how can we even possibly call ourselves civilized as a society when the greatest killer our society faces is loneliness, or to be alone in the world? And increasingly, our societies are telling us that this is the only way that we can, you know, survive as species. And I think we need to have an entire rethink of the ethics, which has pushed us into that position. We are speaking to Brad Evans, author of the Atrocity Exhibition. You can follow Brad on Twitter at H I S T of Violence, and you can find out more about Brad at his website, brad evans.co.uk. You write, terror is not the fear of the unknown. It is born of the fear of things ordinarily taken for granted. It is located in the weaponization of the everyday, and as a result, it sends everything into flux. For nothing holds certainty anymore. Neighbors become potential enemies. Zones of safety are filled with anxiety. Automobiles are turned into weapons of destruction. Is weaponizing everything why terror becomes normalized because we see potential uses for terror in everything? Yes, absolutely. Um, And and I I do fully believe that, you know, what what is it that terrifies us is precisely the fact that, you know, the the subway that you could be going on could become a bomb, right? So it's, it's precisely that alternative use of things that you take for granted. And terror we know operates in, you know, the, that the fundamental regime of terror is to colonize the imagination, to make you imagine the worst case scenario of things that you would normally take for granted. And the ways in which that can, has become normalized post 9-11, you know, one of the things we see, for instance, now is, or we don't see is, you know, you very seldom see a politician today using the term war on terror anymore. It's not that the war has ever been ended or, you know, nobody's declared an end to it. It's just become so normalized politicians no longer even need to utter the term. And part of that that normalization is precisely the fear of the everyday, how everyday fears and the fact that, you know, that, that, a, that a violence could strike you at any given moment, that's part of the fabric of everyday existence. And to me, that's part of the fabric of everyday existence, which is completely unacceptable. We have to do better in terms of thinking of alternative solutions to that. How much is fear, how much is violence, undermining what many call our democratic values and freedoms? Well, we cannot have a democracy governed by fear. So I think if once politics is reduced to the question of survival, as is often the case, and, you know, nobody understood that better than Premo Levi when he was writing his horrifying testimonies, once politics is reduced to the question of survival, everything becomes possible in terms of the, the, the logics of violence, but also Politics is then governed by the logic of fear. What does it mean to exercise freedom if you're living in the shadow of constant fear? What does it mean to exercise who you are and to affirm who you are as a political subject if you're fearful of the repercussions? What does it mean to say, well, you know, I want to engage in the world and I want to bring something positive to the world if you know at any given moment what your message is going to bring could be, the sub, the, you know, subjected to extreme reprisals. So I think fear in itself as a regime is is in a way self-regulating, and it's self-regulating in order to change human behaviors even before that behavior can occur. So certainly there is, there is no democracy if the political order of things operates through and is governed through regimes of fear. You ask if we know that terror reinforces a politics of fear, co-opting us all into its violent logics, which in turn often leads to further violence and retribution. Might we not ask of our own culpabilities in perpetuating its fearful imaginary? How are we culpable, if not complicit? How are we deserving of blame? And how are we actively involved in perpetuating the fear that terror intends to create? How much are we contributing to the success, if you will, of terrorism. Mm-hmm. Well, you see this, you know, and especially I've noticed this um, happen continuously, for instance, in the United Kingdom, where if there is a, you know, a particular small act of violence, often done in the name of, for instance, Islamic terror, um, you could have, for instance, the incidents where there is one person who, you know, attacks a number of armed police officers outside the palaces of Westminster. And it's mainstream media news for three days, and the whole city of London goes into a lockdown. All the news channels are 
you know, constantly paying attention to this in a way in which actually creates the very conditions of terror that the perpetrator wants to create. Now, I'm not saying that there is not dangerous individuals in the world and we shouldn't be mindful of them. They clearly are. But I do think in terms of the heightened attention given to certain forms of violence, as opposed to other forms of violence, can perpetuate narratives which only further exacerbate the anxiety, the insecurity, and, of course, the very evident racial stereotypes, the cultural stereotypes, the religious stereotypes, which play into very reductive narratives around what is the principal form of endangerment in the world. I have so many more questions for you, but we're running out of time, unfortunately, Brad, and I would love to have you back on to continue this conversation in the future. You write commentators were drawn to ask us about the uh, 2017 attack at Westminster, the car that went up on the uh, sidewalk and killed four people and wounded 50 people. You write commentators were drawn to ask about the about all the investment in counter-terror strategies such as the official prevent doctrine. Talking heads like Michael Clark of the Royal United Services Institute appeared to remind us this was the attack the experts had actually been expecting, despite all the preventative strategies. What we must accept is that our societies are fundamentally insecure by design. Why are our societies fundamentally insecure by design? And if they're insecure by design then uh, how much does making them secure and safe from terrorism undermine our societies? Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know, this is kind of also a um, narrative, actually, which has been put forward by a number of politicians who, as I say, try to you know, now get us to buy into the idea of insecurity. But I think what that narrative of insecurity is put forward by the politicians does is to kind of ramp up, and it's always a pretext for the ramping up of the security state. Um, I think what I was trying to get at is, 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 I guess, a question of ethics in terms of, OK, if we understand the, the you know, as, and again, as Nietzsche says, right, to live is to forever be in danger. We are mortal subjects. We are mortal subjects who are capable of being wounded. To me, that is a different order and a different understanding ethically than the security state argument, which basically says we're all insecure. We must need to, you know, must try to secure the subject as much as possible through all the different forms of invasive, you know, interventions, such as you have nothing to hide, you have nothing to be fearful of. What I'm trying to reach for is an understanding, if we say, okay, we are mortal creatures, we can be capable of wounded, we are insecure by design, how can we create better social solidarities to not, of course, make us live eternally, but to try to deal with the insecure sediment of existence in a way where Nobody feels like they're alone in that logic of vulnerability and anxiety. You write what is clearly required here is a different concept of resistance, one that can bring about a fundamental transformation in human relations in a more affirming way. Do you see that kind of resistance in what's called the resistance movement here in the United States, the resistance to Trump? Do you see uh, any kind of success or a new concept of resistance being used there? Mm -hmm. I think the resistance to Trump and you know, uh, obviously it, it's very much a needed resistance takes many different forms. I, I, on the one hand, I think um, the advent of Trump has certainly galvanized resistance in, and you can see in a very positive way. And people have kind of recognized from, you know, even from mainstream journalists to kind of recognize in, OK, you know, we need to have a normative position on this. This is simply not acceptable. And trying to kind of break break down the mask of objectivity to which, which many people hid behind. Part of the thing which I find deeply troubling about resistance, as, as it, and again, it's a very orthodox understanding of resistance, that resistance is simply a negation or resistance means that you counter, for instance, the advent of new fascism through violence. Um, and you have to counter this this head on. I think that's very predictable and very actually reductive. And actually, all it does is actually galvanizes the hatred and division further. So for me, I guess when I, what I understand resistance to mean is a nonviolent form of confrontation, which by its very definition is creative and very much tasked with the affirmation of forms of life and forms of political subjectivity, which doesn't gain any form of validation simply through a counter-violence, because the counter-violence is more morally righteous. I think that's a very dangerous road to go down. And I, you know, obviously, that's, that's clearly the case in some resistance that's taken place in America today, is this 
the shift towards the acceptance of new forms of violence because these, this violence is also necessary. That, to me, creates a very violent dialectic. So what I think is, and as, you, as you've mentioned in the quote, is we need to develop a new concept of politics and the political, which is adequate to the 21st century. And perhaps to take the, ver the, the political categories of empathy, love, and its poetics much more seriously. We have been speaking with political philosopher, critical theorist, writer, and professor Brad Evans, author of Atrocity Exhibition, Life in the Age of Total Violence. One last question for you, Brad, and as we do with all of our guests, our final question is the question from hell, the question you might hate to ask. Our audience might hate your answer or something along those lines. Is, question from hell for you is, is the alt-right an outcome of the war on terror, because you write, all this ultimately plays in the hands of the alt-right, whose allegiances blend Samuel Huntington's clash of uh, civilizations, white supremacy, Islamophobia, and anti-Semitism, with the general desire for political stardom by those seeking to fill the void left by the fallen Milo Yiannopoulos. So is the alt-right, then, an outcome of the war on terror? And if it is, what does that say to us about addressing terrorism with violence? I think the, if we look at the alt-right and what we might call the re-emergence of fascism in the 21st century, I don't think it suddenly fell from the skies. And I think the ideas have actually certainly precede the war on terror. Now, I don't think, for instance, even the likes of Trump and, and the alt-right necessarily make an exceptional departure. What I actually think is they are the result and the acceleration of a lot of dynamics which have been in existence for some considerable time. What they certainly have proved adept at being is parasitic to the political moment. And I'm, I'm often reminded of Wilhelm Reich's book on the mass psychology of fascism and the ways in which fascism and contemporary forms of fascism operate by manipulating the desires of the everyday. It's not about grand debates around sovereignty. It's about job insecurity vulnerabilities of the everyday. And I think what the alt-right has very effectively done is mobilize ontological notions of vulnerability to devastate and effect. Notions around who we are as political subjects, which became normalized post 9-11, they have latched onto that and have managed to mobilize them in many broken communities right across, you know, in the United States of America, certainly in the UK and into wider Europe. So I think that is the dangerous moment that we're in, is precisely that mobilization of vulnerability to devastating political effect. That's Brad Evans. He is currently working on a number of book projects, including Ecce Humanitas, Beholding the Pain of Humanity, which will be published by Columbia University Press next year. And Brad, we hope to have you back on the show before your book comes out, but at least when your new book comes out. Thank you so much for being on our show this week. No wonder Henry loves you so much. No problem, Paul. It's been a great chat with you. Take care. You've been listening to a This Is Hell interview. For more interview hell, and to support the show, visit thisishell.com.